I'm Claudia Catania, and you're listening to Playing On Air. Hi. I'm Marissa Tomei. I'm April Mathis. What's up? My name is John Leguizamo. I'm Dennis O'Hare. I'm Amy Ryan. Hi, I'm Scott Adson. I'm Hamish Linklater. I'm Stephen Boyer. And this is Playing On Air. Join with us to get theater workers back on the job and then back to your earbuds and speakers this fall. Donate now. Donate now. Won't you please donate now to help us put artists back to work? To help us put artists back to work. Why is it so hard to say artists? Visit playingonair.org slash donate to give online. Playingonair.org slash donate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you. Now back to the show. You're about to hear the world premiere of If You Win by Emily Chaddick Weiss, a writer for stage and television. The cast features John Lithgow, the prolific Tony and Emmy-winning actor of Third Rock from the Sun and Netflix The Crown, and Stephen Boyer, Tony nominated for Hand to God and, like Mr. Lithgow, a featured regular on NBC's Trial and Error. If You Win is directed by Giovanna Sardelli. And now, If You Win. Hal Wheelwright, a 60-something Midwestern political candidate, sits at a child's desk in a public school classroom. He's rehearsing his speech. But if we cut the arts, then what do our children do after school? And most importantly, how do they gain and keep their confidence. Uh, Yes? Hi. So sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to introduce myself. Timothy Diamond. Timothy Diamond? Oh, Timmy, Karen's son. I go by Timothy now, but yes. Yeah, so nice to meet you. Your mother's always talking about you. Really? What does she say? Oh, just bragging. (laughs) About me? You must be thinking of the wrong person. Uh, It's you and your sister, right? Jessica? Jessica Diamond, the star of the city council. Yep, that's her. You should have seen her screw up her lines in the junior high production of Music Man, though. She was no star then. (laughs) And you're a a history teacher, right? Was. I'm at the aquarium now. Penguin coordinator. Oh, uh, how nice. (laughs) They seem more interested in me than my students did, especially when I have fish in my hands. (laughs) (laughs) Great to meet you, Timmy. So nice of you to introduce yourself, Uh, Uh, May I ask what brings you to your mother's opponent's town hall tonight? Oddly enough, my wife Carrie dragged me here. She's one of your supporters. You're kidding. Does your mother know? Yeah, she approves. It's okay. Is Carrie here? She's saving our seats. Uh, You're like Romeo and Juliet. I'll have to meet her. See you after, Mr. Wheelwright. Oh, my friend Scott Larkin had you when you were principal in Bexley. He said you were beloved. I remember Scott Larkin. Wore shorts, no matter how cold it was, <laughs> and always munching on the Three Musketeers. <laughs> What's he up to now? Family law. Oh, it's very good. Mm. You know, what, a, what a great school. I wish my mom would do more for education. You do? I think it's great she's so focused on health care, but school funding is suffering, and we both know it's low on her agenda. Huh. It's hard to juggle it all. Uh, Absolutely, especially as a parent. Can't imagine. A lot of people say that. Maybe because I was her son, I didn't see the juggling as much. Well, it must have been seamless. Well, my parents certainly had a system. My dad made lunches and got us dressed, and my mom raised money and went to meetings. Well, that's the life, I suppose. (laughs) I'm sure she came to my soccer games. I just don't remember seeing her there once she got elected. Well, memory's a funny thing. Well, I'd better prep just a few minutes till we start. Of course. Good luck out there. Hmm. Gary's not the only one who wants you to win. Excuse me? I want you to win. So you're here to sabotage me? No, I'm here to help you. We're expecting our first kid. The first grandchild. Uh, Congratulations. Pretty big deal, right? But my dad is no longer around to make sandwiches and cheer us on. And my mom is 72. Does she want to spend her last good years shaking strangers' hands or holding her grandkid? If you win, 
She'll get her life back. I'm sure she's... And if she loses, she'll know what it's like to not get everything she wants and that that's okay and doesn't make her lesser than people who do get what they want. She wasn't always obsessed with winning. Oh, well, I... She's, you shouldn't she's, need to be a winner among family. I need to get back to my speech. Uh, just uh, head back down that hall. I'm sure Carrie's waiting. Do you want to practice for me? Do you, do you need water? I'll set, Timmy. Thanks. Timothy. Well, if you don't need any shade on your opponent, I'll keep it to myself. Their campaign just has so much on you. Like what? I don't mean to scare you. I only bring it up because you deserve to become state rep. I thought you could just use a few tips. And it is your first town hall. I thought you wanted to give me shade, not tips. Uh, sure, tips. What do they have on me? The main... No, I, 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 never mind. I'm, I'm fine on my own. Okay, then. You chose a great setting for the town hall. Children's artwork everywhere, the rows of lockers lining the hallways, a big historic auditorium. I'm sure my mom would choose a school, except she wouldn't want to get nailed on gun control. She's pro-gun control. Yet she supports Representative Howard's constitutional carry initiative. And what does he give her? He says he'll vote for her health care bill. Well, that's politics. Sure, but it doesn't make her pro-gun control. I really don't appreciate this attempt at sabotage. Is your mother that worried I'll win? I told you, I'm not sabotaging you. Yet you've taken away all my prep time, and now I'm going to be very nervous. She gets nervous, too. Use the nerves. They make you seem energized. Does your mother think I'll win? She's smart enough not to assume anything. Oh. But don't assume you're the superior candidate. They haven't publicized your dirt yet. I don't assume. Because you that, that, say you're pro-gun control, yet your household owns five guns. We inherited them from Sherry's grandparents. Which is why they're conveniently not registered under your name. That's not... And her campaign knows your wife cheated on you with Senator Connors. She hasn't done it in a few months, but they know. They're just friends. <sighs> How dare you? Friends who get hotel rooms together? Better you find out before your constituents do. Get out of here. We still have three minutes. Why don't you practice your speech for You're me? You're useless to me. Now you sound like mom. If you don't leave, I'll have security escort you out. You know, you're not as nice as everyone says. I was looking forward to being partners. Why would I ever trust you? Because your win is our win. You get your power trip, and I get my mother to tune back into our family's life. She gets a second chance to be the caring, fun, genuine mother she used to be. Maybe you don't understand, because you never had kids. She seems tuned into Jessica's life. <laughs> you know, you're just a washed-up principal looking for something to fill your time. But I still wish you the victory. Yes, yeah, so you can have your mommy back. So it can ruin your soul like it ruined hers. And you won't even have a loving wife or any doting kids to cushion the blow. You don't know what my wife and I have been through. You feel so sorry for yourself not being loved enough. We all feel sorry for ourselves. No one gets everything. You think your mother feels victorious all the time? She probably spends more time worrying about you than anything involving the well-being of our district. Don't you think you can do better than bringing me down, Timothy? Because I think you can. And you'd better start today, because if you don't, people will really start to see you as the loser you claim to be. You'll convince them that you truly are just a failed history teacher who can only earn the respect of penguins. And only when you've got fish in your hands. Nice speech. But you should know I'm okay being a loser. <laughs> that can't be true. When I was six, before my mom got the bright idea to run for office, she'd take me to the aquarium every Saturday morning. No Jessica, just us. And she told me when she was a kid, she wanted to train the penguins. Now I'm training them. I'm their state rep, and she has no idea how much they love me. The winner forgets what matters. 
Timothy. What? I'm going to use your tip about my nerves. Thanks. You just heard Emily Chaddick Weiss's If You Win, directed by Giovanna Sardelli. Performances by John Lithgow as Hal and Stephen Boyer as Timothy. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. Uh, Hello. Stephen Boyer. Yes. And John Lithgow. You worked together recently on NBC's comedy Trial and Error. What was it like first meeting each other and then working together? Anything you learned? Well, we we had worked together only a year before in something very, very similar. Oh, so similar. I was King Lear and he was the fool. (laughs) Yeah. And in fact, when they asked me to do the role in Trial and Error, they said, and we're going after Steve Boyer to play Dwayne. Uh, and, and that was such a selling point. <laughs> it was really a big reason why they, I did it. Wow. So I auditioned for Trial and Error, and they said, we ideally want John Lithgow to be the murder suspect. It, you know, it's a mockumentary of these true crime murder docs. And uh, I was like, oh, great. And so I sent you an email That's saying, right. I heard that you were going to do that. And you were like, I haven't heard about this That's yet. That's right. But... <laughs> it, was the, it was the first I'd heard about it. And I was like, oh, I ruined this. Emily, you wrote this play specifically for your husband, the prodigious Stephen Boyer, and John That's Lithgow. That's why you look familiar. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and John Lithgow, the legend of stage, film, and TV. Oh, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> I have to control myself from gushing. What was that process like How did If You Win evolve? So I had seen their collaborations before, and they were always kind of on the same team in their previous plays and TV. So I wanted a contentious relationship. And, you know, I have politics on the mind. I'm excited about all the women in politics. And I wanted to kind of go to a darker underbelly place with, you know, how men kind of surround women now that we're rising up a little bit more. And I wanted something that was a tricky relationship for both of them to navigate. So I thought they would do well with this. And I'm very pleased. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. So we can stay married? Yeah, I'll think about it. They They came to see my uh, one-man show, Stories by Heart, at the Roundabout Theater. And it was just wonderful to see the two of them. And I blithely said, come on, Emily, when are you going to write a play for me and Stevie? (laughs) (laughs) Giovanna Sardelli, director, in the little time that you had to direct today, what was your number one goal? What was the most important note to make clear? I actually wanted to hear the story since... I, I'm not used to that, where you can't see an actor's face. So for me, I wanted to close my eyes and make sure someone was telling me a great story. And I know both these gentlemen are incredibly funny. So I also wanted to make sure that I uh, chuckled a few times. And mm-hmm. I did. <laughs> <laughs> and if you win, how is nervous about his upcoming Meet the Candidate town hall event at the local school and Timmy suggests he use his nerves. At what point in the process of preparing or performing a play do you most experience nerves, and how do you cope? Well, you certainly are much more nervous in front of an audience than you are in front of a mic. But you're always insecure when you first open your mouth and say a line, and somebody else is listening. I think that's true. Yeah. For me, when I transitioned from acting to directing learning how to watch without abject terror because I can't control anything. If it goes wrong or if it's terrible, I just sit in my seat and go, oh, 
God, that's happening. <laughs> there is nothing I can do to make that not be happening right yeah, now. Yeah, see, as a playwright, I feel like the lack of control I have once the show is up is quite a relief. Like, oh, really? I went bungee jumping with my sister, and, you know, the bungee jumping guys tied us together, and I thought, well, it's out of my control, and they seem to know what they're doing. So <laughs> I'll just go with it. And I think there's that lack of control I have once my show is up. I'm like... My job here is done, and it is what it is. So that's sort of when the nerves disappear for me. <laughs> God, I, I remember I did a lot of directing when I was very young and starting out. And one thing that upset me about being a director was just the opposite of what you said, Emily. You open a show, you go away, and it belongs to the actors, yeah. and they get all the joy out of it. Of course, they have the responsibility and the burden and the anxiety, but they get the joy, and you're gone. The yep. director comes back after two weeks, and nobody's even listening. No, know? I know, and everyone's made improvements. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, they don't want to hear notes. Uh, hmm. That's funny. <laughs> yep. I find that there's different points where nerves hit sort of with regularity, especially when you're rehearsing and performing uh, a play, it's like I think that the very first time that you stand up from the table and have to walk and talk at the same time, a certain specific brand of nerves hit. You're like, <laughs> it's like the first time I've ever walked and spoken in my <laughs> life. Yes, right. Emily, in your play, If You Win, Timmy attempts to derail his mother's career he says of his mom to his mom's opponent, if you win, she'll get her life back. What do you make of his premise and behavior, everybody? It makes me think about there are people that are in professions where it's their job to help people, people like therapists and politicians and, you know, social workers. Their entire career is just helping others. And I've always wondered what it would be like seeing their home life and if they have enough in them to also give it to their family, you know, to, to give their family what they need. I mean, maybe people do. Maybe a politician is able to give their constituents everything that they need to make their lives better and also give their family what they need out of a parent. But uh, maybe not. You know, maybe you prioritize one over the other. Right. Like a therapist who is actually a a bad, inept parent, you know, has always been a, something that's been interesting to me. My dad's a psychologist, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Dad. It's Father's Day yesterday. It was fun. Everything's great. <laughs> and my mom uh, was a CEO, and I actually, she came home, you know, at 6.30 every night. So she did a really beautiful job, I think, of balancing her family and a big career. And... I think when I was setting out to write this play, it was really about, it wasn't so much about balancing career and family, but about some people in the family being winners and some not getting that feeling of victory and how that can kind of rot your soul and how that lack of confidence when you see your whole family winning and you just kind of being can hurt your daily life. Yeah, Mr. Lithgow. John. <laughs> <laughs> Prior to playing state representative candidate to Hal Wheelwright today, you've played Bill Clinton mm -hmm. and Lucas, Nate, Hillary, and Clinton on Broadway. You recently played another politician, Winston Churchill, on Netflix, The Crown. What have you learned about what makes a political leader tick? I don't know how much you actually learn well, about a prime minister or a president when you impersonate them. You certainly do a lot of research, and particularly in the case of Churchill, I've never done so much research in my life, mainly because it was so fascinating. He was such a, a complex character with so many layers to him. And I think what I learned about Churchill was how much... What we know about Churchill was informed by his childhood. In so many ways, Churchill's life was uh, all sorts of variations on overcompensation and overcoming insecurity that you just, you read all about that in his childhood. 
which is a fascinating thing. Someone who personally was credited with winning the war against Hitler, saving his nation, a man who had every reason to have a tremendous sense of his own importance, self-possessiveness, and security. In fact, he was very insecure underneath all that. Every character has sort of levels of insecurity, and that's what you explore when you play the part. Mm -hmm. Same with Bill Clinton, God knows. Uh, same with Roger Ailes, whom I also played in the yeah. past year. That's interesting, because they do seem to have a common denominator of a difficult childhood. Well, yeah. we all have difficult childhoods. Childhood is difficult. <laughs> yeah. And I do think that you learn a lot about people when you learn about their childhood. And that runs through this play. Stephen and Emily, like Timmy and Carrie, you are new parents yourselves. So I want to ask John Lithgow again, who has a family. <laughs> Do you have any advice for new parents, playwright Emily and actor Stephen? Well, I, <laughs> I, can't, I can't wait, wait to hear this. They are very lucky to have such a wise and experienced <laughs> seasoned friend. Knowing these two, I feel they have absolutely nothing to worry about, and their little boy Robin is extremely lucky to have such parents. Oh, thank you. That's very sweet. <laughs> it's been an honor having you all here. I hope we can play again soon. Emily Shattuck Weiss, playwright of If You In, Giovanna Sardelli, its director, Stephen Boyer, who played Timmy Diamond, and as Hal Wheelwright, John Lithgow. A real pleasure. Thank, thank you so you. much, Claudia. Thank you. And thank so you, much. Emily, for your wonderful play. You've been listening to Playing on Air, Great American Short Plays with Great American Actors. Associate Producer, Michelle O'Brien. Literary Manager, Bonnie Antosh. Literary Assistant, Aditya Pratama. Marketing and Communications Manager, Shelley Horwitz. Theme and Play Music, Tom Cochan, Recording and Sound Design, John Kilgore, Audio Editing, Julia Melfi. Playing on Air is distributed by PRX, Public Radio Exchange. For Playing on Air, I'm your host, Claudia Catania. Thanks for listening.